So arthrogryposis is really more of an umbrella term. Um, and my favorite way to explain that is very much if you say you have a cold, then I know that you probably have a running nose and you're coughing and you might have a fever, uh, but I don't know if it's a virus you have or a bacteria or you've got allergies or something along those lines. Uh, it's the same with arthrogryposis. It is a descriptive term that uh, is, explains that a child has been born with multiple contractures of their joints, but it doesn't tell us what the underlying cause is. And there can be a whole bunch of different causes. Um, there can be uh, genetic abnormalities, things are going on with the chromosomes. Uh, there can be things that uh, affect muscles primarily, affect nerves primarily, affect the spinal cord. Uh, and a lot of those issues can be very difficult to figure out. So you have a lot of people in genetics uh, who are looking into those things. Um, we kind of divide, or at least I do, I divide arthrogryposis into kind of three big categories. So the, the single biggest uh, category is the, uh, the kids with amyoplasia. Uh, and these are kind of what our typical idea of a child with arthrogryposis is. The arms and the legs are usually affected, although sometimes the legs are more affected than the arms or vice versa. Um, and they tend to be the kids with the worst contractures to a certain degree. Uh, and the thinking now is that it's caused by something that uh, affects the spinal cord very early on uh, in pregnancy, someplace between the 8th and the 11th week. Um, maybe there's been uh, a temporary interruption to the blood supply coming to the baby, so the baby's not getting as much blood from the mom as it needs, not enough no oxygen, and the little cells are forming within the spinal cord uh, are injured. And these particular cells are called the anterior horn cells, and they are the connection between the spinal cord and the nerve going off to the muscle. So the connection between the spinal cord and the nerve going off to your skin so you can feel things, those aren't affected. And babies with arthrogryposis, children with arthrogryposis can feel very well. Um, but what happens is that the muscles aren't working very well. The second category is something called uh, distal arthrogryposis. Uh, and this is also, started off think, looking like it was one condition and now uh, I think Dr. Judy Hall uh, in Vancouver has gotten it out to some 20 or so conditions. Uh, and they all have a specific genetic uh, underpinning. Something went wrong in genetics itself. And for that reason, uh, the muscles developing very early on in the baby uh, don't completely develop. And these are the muscles uh, we call the fast twitch muscles. So when you use your fingers, these are very fast twitch muscles versus when you're using your elbow, these are slower twitch. You don't have to work as fast, uh, but they tend to be bigger muscles. So you have fast twitch muscles in your, in your hands and in your feet, and those don't seem to work appropriately in the, in the fetus, in the developing baby. And since they're not moving, uh, then the joints don't develop correctly. Um, and we'll get to that in a little bit more. The third big category uh, is everything else. So in that you've got kids who were primarily uh, born with a brain problem, and so the brain wasn't talking to the muscles and they weren't moving. Uh, kids born with uh, problems where the nerve doesn't talk to the muscle correctly, uh, so they called Escobar syndrome, where there's a, the, the neurotransmitter, the chemical that the nerve needs to release to get a muscle to jump, that that's not working, so that connection is lost. Uh, but there are some 250 different diagnoses in this third category. Uh, and that's where it can be very difficult to figure out does somebody have amyoplasia or in the, are they in the third category? If the third category, what do they have? Um, and it can sometimes take many, many years for a geneticist to really figure out what the problem is, if they ever figure it out at all. Um, but we think that the underlying problem to all these kids born with contractures is that the muscles weren't working uh, when they were getting put together. Uh, and that's something called uh, fetal akinesia. Fetal, of course, a developing baby. Uh, kinesia is, in a sense, means movement. So akinesia is the lack of movement. So the babies weren't moving. And what happens is that uh, the joints don't develop normally. So when you're moving as a baby, uh, everything is, is getting developed around that. The joint is learning how it's supposed to move. The soft tissues are learning how to stretch out. Uh, the, uh, the ligaments are getting developed in the right way. 
So if they don't move, then you don't end up with all the wrinkles, like the wrinkles we have on our fingers. Uh, you don't have this nice kind of knobby type appearance we have to our fingers. Our fingers are almost kind of spindle-like. And we see that in the knees. We see that uh, in the elbows and all the other joints. And oftentimes you actually see these little dimples around joints where we're not used to seeing those on ourselves. And that's actually where the soft tissues got stuck to the joint because they never had a reason to move like they do with uh, most of us. When I see kids in the clinic, I realize that the ones I'm seeing are probably the lucky ones. Because it's estimated that uh, one third of kids who um, have arthrogryposis, again, born with contractures, that they don't survive. Um, and these are the kids who their underlying conditions are the more severe things. Um, now, before anybody gets worried and say, ah, I've got a, a two-month-old baby and they got arthrogryposis, does this mean that my baby's at risk? No, usually the ones uh, with a severe arthrogryposis, uh, they are either stillborn or they're really in trouble from the very start. So the ones who uh, are otherwise healthy babies but with a bunch of contractures or maybe they have some feeding issues early on but they otherwise have good heart and lungs, um, those are the ones are gonna, that are going to survive and do well. But it's uh, early on, uh, there is a very high mortality rate. There's a, a lethal form of arthrogryposis. So my friend Judy Hall uh, from Vancouver, uh, who probably knows more about arthrogryposis than anybody else, came up with this great idea of saying, well, certainly there's a golden three months at the end of pregnancy uh, and a golden three months at the beginning of a child's life when they are their most flexible and you can probably achieve the most with them in a short period of time. And so her thoughts are that during the end of pregnancy, if you know if you, you have a child with arthrogryposis, you want to do everything you can to move them. So, of course, all this happens with a doctor's consent, but the idea is you want to wake your baby up a lot and get them moving around. So she actually advocates drinking caffeinated beverages, coffee or a cola or whatever else. So that not only wakes you up, but it helps wake the baby up. Uh, doing exercise. You do exercise, it wakes the baby up, the baby does exercise. Um, even doing something as simple as taking a, a several deep breaths every day, because that also kind of jostles the baby, gets them moving around. And all that is what she likes to call interuterine physical therapy. And I just love that concept. Uh, whether or not it works, who only knows, but it, at least you're doing something that would make reasonable sense because what do we do after the baby is born then we move the baby and we try to get the baby to move so if you take that same concept and you just do that within the womb then you're probably also helping those joints develop the first my first advice for parents with a, a new child is to take heart in the fact that your newborn baby uh, looks the worst that they're going to look kids with arthrogryposis uh, over time they stretch out um, they get strength in areas that they, you didn't think that they would get strength and things only get better. So that little baby that you first see there uh, looks the worst that they're going to look. Um, and with that in mind, you should look at your baby as being a bundle of potential. And you need to find somebody who looks at your baby the same way. Um, we don't at this point in time really have an organization of uh, pediatric orthopedists uh, you know, who talk about arthrogryposis, we haven't gotten that far. Um, and so a lot of this is really word of mouth. Uh, one of the things that we've been trying to do uh, in AMC SI, AMC support, is uh, have a chat board for people to actually be able to say, hey, I've got this doctor uh, nearby that I'm really comfortable with, uh, and this is the things that they're doing, and I would recommend them. Or conversely, well, I went to this doctor, didn't really seem to be up on the newer things that we can do, uh, so I suggest looking for somebody else. Um, and that's probably the best way of doing it. Uh, even for my own colleagues, you know, outside of uh, Philadelphia, I'm not really sure necessarily who I can recommend and who I can't because I haven't talked to that many people about, you know, what's your philosophy on treating children with arthrogryposis. Considering that most kids with arthrogryposis, the initial thing you need to do is work on their feet. Uh, what I would suggest is going to a, uh, the Ponsetti websites 
and looking for someone in your area that treats children uh, with the Ponce, or treat, treats uh, club feet with the Ponsetti method, because they would probably be fairly comfortable, even if they don't see a lot of kids with arthritis post, they'd be fairly comfortable making that, that uh, broadening out to treat the, the, the child with arthrogryposis and club feet. Uh, and then once you got that uh, taken care of, then you can think of, okay, now is this the right person I want to, to talk to about the hips, or do I want to look further around to see if there's anybody else who does that? The broader thing, I think, are uh, being in a, in a community of other parents with kids with arthrogryposis, or for the kids to be among all these other kids with arthrogryposis. Uh, I still remember, again, that first convention I went to, walking to the hotel lobby and seeing all these kids all over the place, running around, running around the pool, kids in wheelchairs, you know, next to kids who are walking, uh, and everybody was getting, around, getting along so great. And you start to, you stop for a second, you realize this is the first time that they've been able to play with somebody who hasn't been going, hey, what's, you know, what's going on with you? How come you're different? Um, and they're truly having a blast. Uh, and I think that also that allows everybody to kind of relax. My kids are having fun and I can find out from somebody else what to do. Uh, there's a lot of support that goes on. Uh, not only the structured things that happen in the conference, the, um, the moments when people can get up there and talk about the successes they've had or the barriers they faced, uh, but also just those, those little groups of parents getting together and talking about what their kids have been up to. Um, and I think that's also when the best sharing happens in terms of things like, you know, how do you help your child uh, get dressed? Uh, how do you deal with the school issues? You know, all those things are wonderful. We're also gradually getting more and more adult members into AMC support. Our president, who's been with the group forever, uh, you know, she's got arthrogryposis. We've got a number of board members who have arthrogryposis. Uh, and they bring something that is so unique. I, I need to learn from them what are the goals for adults. You know, I've got my goals for these kids, but my goals might be different than somebody who's an adult with arthrogryposis, what they think their goals should be. Uh, and that's why we keep on learning from each other. So uh, I think um, I have plenty of families who say, well, you know, I'm a member of, of the support group. I go on the chat lines or I go to the website. Um, so I think I know what's going on, and I keep on trying to get them to go to a conference because I've not met anybody who's gone to a conference and goes, ah, yeah, that was neat, but I could have done without it. Everybody really, uh, I think it's expanded their universe significantly. We want people to be hungry for knowledge. We want people to reach out. Uh, and thank God for the internet. That's all I can say. We are so lucky uh, that we are here at this time when there's so much information that people can get uh, relatively easily. Um, now, unfortunately, it's not available to everybody, so not everybody gets that information in time. Um, but, you know, not be comfortable with the first, uh, the, um, the first opinion that you get, uh, the first ideas that you get about your child, and keep looking out there for what else can be done. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's a, something that I need to mention, too, is that's also what makes it so rewarding, is the wonderful families I've met, the, uh, the parents who have uh, not only a child with arthrogryposis, but have gone out and adopted children with arthrogryposis or with other uh, handicaps. Um, that is just so wonderful uh, that you got people that have, have that big hearts to go out and do that. Uh, and they are partners. You know, there's a lot of people who are worried about getting to ortho pediatric orthopedics because, uh, well, I have to deal with the parents. Uh, and I think most of us who are actually in the field see parents as partners or people to work along with uh, and to enjoy the successes of what their kids are able to do.